Hello and a very warm welcome on behalf of NTI Audio. The topic of today is the acoustic performance of classrooms. Let me please first introduce myself. My name is Markus Becker. I will moderate this presentation and I'm assisted today by Thomas Hoop, our technical director. He is taking care of the incoming questions. The topics that we have prepared for you start with a um, brief look on the motivation, why we are dealing with this topic and the scope of this webinar, followed by an overview of a typical situation and some words and explanations about background noise, reverberation time and speech intelligibility. We have also prepared a practical presentation for you and after that we will summarize the typical procedure how to execute the, the re related measurements and uh, other actions. In the end I will come back to the questions that have popped in and possibly provide some additional comments. I expect that the whole webinar will last approximately half an hour. Well, it is quite obvious that we should strive for good acoustic quality in classrooms. Otherwise, we will suffer under poor speech intelligibility. A bad classroom acoustics will result in compromised attention of the students and, of course, also of an accelerated fatigue of teachers and students. For that reason, a couple of national and international standards have been launched to cope with this topic. I have listed three of them here. The German DIN 18041 is one of them. Then there is a British standard. You can see below the full terminology of that standard. It's the Education Funding Agency, which has issued performance standards for the Priority Schools Building Program. And we also have an American standard from the Acoustical Society of America, the ANSI S12.60. These three standards are the base of today's presentation and they all deal with the acoustic performance of classrooms. An important hint is that in this webinar we will focus on existing classrooms which means we will not provide any information about architectural hints or measures but we will assist you in evaluating the acoustic performance of a classroom and taking adequate measures to improving the situation if necessary. So let us take a look on a typical setup. Here we have a classroom. So what makes the acoustic performance of this classroom? First of all, it's of course the noise, the sound that is generated within the room be it from the teacher, the students, or an air conditioner, a PC, or any other electronic devices generating sound. Then we have sound coming from outside of the room, through the window, through the wall, for instance, construction site noise, uh, traffic noise, whatever it is. Now, if we go one step further and we look the floor above, maybe there's another room, maybe a music room, which is creating more sound, which is um, going through the ceiling, through the um, floor. This is, could be airborne noise, or let's assume these people here are dancing. It could also be impact noise from them stamping on the floor. All these noise will also be, will contribute to the acoustic performance of the room below. Another important aspect is the reverberation time in our classroom. And this sums up altogether to the speech intelligibility. Well, it is quite apparent that the external noise is hardly to control for you. If, let's suppose, you have the task to optimize the situation within that room. And for that reason, I will focus in this webinar on these three topics, the internal noise, the reverberation time, and the speech intelligibility. Let's start with part one the noise level measurement. These are typically executed as A or C weighted equivalent sound level. These are 
averaged values over a longer period of time and they give a very good reference for the background noise in a room. Um, we have two possible weightings, the A weighted, which would be the standard weighting representing the human hearing perception, or the C weighting, which has the advantage that it has a lower attenuation of the low frequencies. So if you are, for instance, in a room where you have a very low frequency hum, which is not maybe directly audible, but it contributes to your uh, feeling, to the way how you um, feel in that room, uh, you can identify these low frequency components by measuring the C-weighted level and subtracting from it the A-weighted level. And that gives you, if the difference is significant, that gives you an indication that there are low frequency components present in the room. The question how long you have to measure is answered by the standard. Some of them say 60 minutes, others say 30 minutes. Uh, depends, of course, also on the situation you are facing. Generally, keep in mind, you should make these background noise measurements in a standard situation, so not during silent nighttime, but during daytime. And it should be long enough to provide a relevant uh, result on the actual situation. Then we have the question where to measure, and the answer is quite simple. Look for the noisiest point in the listening area and place your microphone at the height where typically the heads, the ears of the students are. Let's take a closer look at this background noise. We have measured it and now we want to identify the sources, especially those sources that come from outside, because maybe we have the possibility to change the situation a little bit. For instance, if we have a leakage below the door or a crack in the wall or in a window, wherever, so that needs to be plugged in order to minimize the impact from external noise. Another possible sound source could be the air conditioner. Maybe you have the um, possibility to improve that as well, but it's definitely important to identify this source if it is, if it is contributing a relevant uh, part to the overall background noise. So the target is always to minimize the impact of external noise sources. But what is the absolute target? What should you strive for? Well, the standards say that typically the background noise in the unoccupied room, so without pupils, without teacher being present, should be below 35 dB A weighted or 55 dB C weighted. Um, then comes another request from the standard, which is more tricky, which is more difficult to achieve. And that is that the voice level of the teacher should be 10 to 20 dB higher than the background noise level in the occupied room, so with the students being present. The challenge here is that you have to, to determine somehow the background noise level of the room with the students, with the pupils, but without the teacher talking. So you have to look for a good moment, for a good time to measure this background noise level and then find out whether the voice of the teacher is 10 to, db, to 20 dB higher than this background noise level. Now, part two of our presentation copes with the reverberation time. Reverberations are very important because, to a certain extent, they improve the intelligibility. If you look at this schematic sketch, Aside of the direct sound from the teacher to the students, we have some reflections, for instance, via the ceiling. And these reflections actually improve the intelligibility here. However, other types of reflections, for instance, those that come back from the rear wall, they deteriorate the um, acoustic situation. So they have a negative impact, especially if there is a delay and noticeable time delay from these reflections, or if the overall sum of reflections is even getting louder than the direct noise from the teacher. So that has to be avoided. How do we determine this reverberation time? Here we have the Sabine formula, which says that the RT60 value can be calculated with these parameters. 
V stands for the volume of the room, the total surface of the room, and the absorption coefficient of the surface. Well, in reality, it's not that simple because you have different surfaces in the room. Maybe you have a carpet floor, you have a wooden ceiling, you have a concrete wall, whatever. So you have to determine the surface multiplied by the corresponding absorption coefficient of that surface and add each of these, ter add each of these terms together to this overall yeah, determinator here. Another more straightforward approach is to measure the reverberation time. Actually, we have already broadcasted a webinar on measuring RT60. You can take a look on that. It's on, published on our website. Here, I would just like to point out that this measurement needs to be executed in the unoccupied room, so there are no teacher, no pupils present. The reason is quite simple. The test signal that you need coming here from this Dudikahedron uh, loudspeaker is very loud, very noisy, and you don't want to expose anybody to this very high noise level. It could damage the hearing of the people who are present. So that, for that reason, you have to execute this measurement in the unoccupied room, and then, which is very important, you have to compensate the result with the effect that uh, of people when people would be present. The reason is that any person has an absorption of sound. We human, our human body is absorbing sound. So if there are persons present in the room, that has an impact on the RT60, and you have to. Uh, mathematically compensate this effect after having measured the RT60 in the unoccupied room. I will come back to that point later. What are the targets for the reverberation time in classrooms? The British and the American standard, depending on the size of the room and of the purpose, have a target of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 or 7 0.8 seconds. The DIN, the st German standard, is a little bit more um, sophisticated. Here we have this graph which shows us, depending on the volume of the room, we have a direct um, relation to the target RT60 time. If the room is larger, going even to 5,000 cubic meter, can be even higher. So this would be a lecture hall in these smaller rooms, maybe you have some discussions from time to time, that's also important to have the RT60 lower, whereas here is more a lecture hall that's not that important. But if you have students with moderate hearing loss in that room, you have to look for a lower um, RT60, a, a reverberation time. So generally, very important, when you want to determine the RT60 reverberation time for your classroom, Take a look at the applicable standard so that you are sure you are uh, striving for the correct target. What can you do when the RT60 is too high? Well, you can install sound absorbers, for instance, in the ceiling, be that whether they are hanging or whether they are sticked to the ceiling. You can um, install them at the wall or use some sound absorbing curtains. Or a third possibility would be to use this self-adhesive foam, sound-absorbing foam, and stick that to the underside of tables and chairs. This is also um, applicable and um, quite efficient measure to reduce the RT60 time. Anyway, keep in mind, especially when we talk about the ceiling, that you leave some um, reflecting parts of the ceiling so that you have this positive effect from the reverberation in that direction. Well, some few words about speech intelligibility. Actually, it's only a few standards who require, for instance, the British standard stipulates that you look that you should look for an STI of 0 0.6 or better or higher. The other standards not necessarily look for that, but it is recommendable that you, if you have the possibility, you acquire these measurements because it will give you additional feedback on the quality of your job, on the quality of the measures that have been taken. How do you do that? You would place a talk box here in the position of the speaker. I'm going to show you that enlarged. Here we have this talk box. This is a standardized speaker that creates the steeper test signal 
um, with a equalized flat frequency response and a level of 60 dB in one meter distance. And with that device being placed here, you can now execute the measurements at the positions where the pupils are sitting and determine the speech intelligibility in that way. Well, I'm at the point of my practical presentation, but uh, I don't want to go too much into these measurement details. I rather want to show you how to cope with this reverberation time. Um, just imagine you have measured the RT60 from your classroom and you realize it's not sufficient. You have to do something about it. You have to improve it. So what can you do? And actually, we have a new software that will be published these days which will assist you in this job. And let me show you how that works. Let's start from scratch. We take a new file. We select standards. So here are the standards that are already implemented. There will be more to follow. Now for the time being, I select the DIN 18041. And I have to decide which type of room I'm looking at. So let's look here for a room with need for noise reduction and room comfort. So having made this selection, we can confirm. And now we import, um, for instance, a picture of the room. We have maybe taken a photo just as a reference. I'm going to show you that so that you get an impression. Here, when I hover over it, you see this is a typical office here in our company that was newly built. And I'm going to show you the performance, the acoustic performance of this room. So first I have to edit the dimensions of that room. It's a small one. It's uh, not uh, comparable to a classroom, but um, the basic principle is, of course, the same. So here I'm editing the dimension. And in the next step, I will import the measured RT60 results from the status before I took any action before having installed any absorber. So drag and drop. Now let's take a look at these measurements. This one looks nice, this one too. That's something wrong with this, so delete it. This one is okay, this one is awkward. Let's delete it. And yeah, these are the four stable and quite significant measurements. We can take a look at the average of these four measurements. Um, and here, take a look at the overall picture. Here we have the average plus the green area shows us the target. The target is given by our selection of the standard and of the room type. Now we see that we are too high. We have to do something about the situation in this room. What can we do? First of all, we know that in this office there will be two persons sitting on upholstered chairs. Well, you see this dotted line shows us the effect of these two persons. This is a calculation that is done from the software based on the existing measurement result. It's not a um, simulation of the room. The software cannot do that, but it can give you a feedback on the effect of measures relative to the acquired measurement data. So we see we have to do more. We have to add material. Now, what kind of material? We have a list of typical sound absorbing materials here in the software. I select this one. That's the one I actually used. I confirm. It's, in, uh, it's a absorbing play, uh, panel that has been mounted to the ceiling. And here you can see the sound absorbing performance of this material. And if you want to know where did I get this data from, let me show you the data sheet of this material. Here you can see at 50 millimeter thickness of these panels, you have these sound absorption coefficients for the corresponding octave bands. And that is actually what I edited here in this table. So I confirm and I have to tell the software how large the square area of this panel nine square meter and now you see that that gives me a major impact the projected performance is much better now with this plane now i install that and i want to see whether this has given me the effect i want so for that purpose i have to import the measurement results after 
the installation of these panels. Ah, sorry, that's a, the wrong. I need this graph. So here I drag and drop. Now you see they have been imported. Looks uh, okay. Now let me maybe this one is a little bit awkward. Let's delete that. So let's take these four results. They are very close to each other and assign them to the second cycle. The first cycle was the status before the installation of the any, any material and the second one was after that. Okay, and now I swap to this design and here you can see now the blue curves down here shows me, yes, okay, my the effects of my work was actually quite well. It's very close to the predicted uh, performance of the room and it's within this frequency band, it's also within the given tolerance. So you can see with this tool you have a nice assistant to identify potential measures, to identify the effects of these measures, whether they are probably sufficient and then you can also verify and you can print out the result uh, as a proof of your work. Good, let me get back to my webinar presentation and summarize the typical procedure. The first step would be to note the dimensions of the room, maybe to make a sketch of the layout so that you can uh, draw in there the place where you have executed your background measurements uh, at the loudest point and so on. Next, you would measure the background noise at this loudest position. You would identify, hopefully, leaks or sound sources and, if possible, minimize the impact of these external noise sources. Then, the next step would be to measure the reverberation time in the empty room and add this compensating factor. Evaluate the results with the software that I just showed to you and also identify possible measures that will assist you to improve the situation, the acoustic performance. And the last step would be to verify the effect of the measures that you have taken. Well, that's actually the presentation I wanted to give you. I want to take the occasion and thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was able to answer most of your questions. From my point of view, thank you very much for your interest. Um, I hope to see you again in one of our future webinars. Have a good day and bye-bye.